Hey guys, Joe Pye here, Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. If you are here from the previous shorty video, thank you for coming back. This is the part that we're going to make today, and this is the part that the, the raw material that it's going to come out of. So, the part is a little bit smaller than the drawing, I would say. Always looks better on paper, right? Always looks bigger on paper. Initial operation, I'm going to do the end detail, pop that hole in. At all banking from the outside so I know that this is a reliable material reliable such that I know dimensionally what it looks like I'm gonna stand it up right in a second vise to do the holes on either end and I got to tell you if you don't have if you don't have one of these I know that might be a big nut to crack, and you're going to have to dig deep in your pockets to get a quality one, but secondary handling vices are just so fantastic. It gives you so many options when you can put a vice in a vice or mount a smaller vice to a rotary table. If you don't have a vice or a fixture plate, invest in one. You will not be sorry. It's going to sting initially, but it'll be so worth it. You'll use it a million times and say, damn, we should have had one years ago. Anyway. Let me set this up, square this up, we'll put this on the rotary table and pick up some edges, pop a hole, work some magic, and just keep on going. Here we go. My first step in approaching this part is the initial positioning of the part. Vice on the rotary table. Vice is parallel to my back rail. Everything is set on zero uh, rotationally. And I have a helper block pressing the brass blank against the stationary jaw here because I used the one, two, three block in the back to initially set the square. be absolutely sure run the indicator up and down the back just to make sure that we're vertical this part will have to be repositioned uh, one more time during this end I'm going to use an edge finder to find the hole and then I need to get the hole over the center of the rotary table for the keyhole type feature I'm going to put on the end of this so uh, edge finder first hole drill and ream bore plunge and end mill whatever it takes to get to the right size and then we will take the vise off, track the table, put the hole under that particular axis, and work from there. A simple edge finding operation to put the spindle of the machine over the large hole location to begin the part. Always check it two or three times. With the end successfully decked off, center drill and drill the hole for the clutch. Indicate the rotary. Indicate the spindle to verify the rotary. Bump the vise around until the hole in the part is directly under the spindle. Roughly estimate the angle of the feature you want so you know when you rotate the part it's correct. Before we shift this part into location, just as a general refresher, each one of these graduations on the outside of the rotary table is one degree. 340 degrees, one, two, three, four, five, a little line taller, six, seven, eight, nine, 350 degrees, and so on. Let's look at the dial. Each full 360 degree rotation of this particular dial is four degrees. Each one of these graduations on the dial is a minute. So 60 minutes per degree. 20 30 40 50 coming around and there's your there's your one degree the lines in between like i said are minutes so if i wanted to go one degree one minute i would go there one degree one minute because if i continue to go one degree 60 minutes it turns into two degrees so that setting is one degree one minute these are seconds in increments of 15 seconds 15 excuse me 10 20 30 40 50 60 so each one of these lines is 10 seconds if I want to see 30 seconds I'm looking at the line in the center and what you do is you bring the next closest line in line with that at which time this zero should be halfway between one minute and two minutes right one minute 30 seconds would be right in between one minute 60 seconds would be the next line so bring the closest line to the graduation you want 
into alignment right there you can see that the zero moved into the halfway point between one minute and two minutes and the 30 minute 30 second mark is lined up with the next closest graduation this is what i'll be looking for to set the angle for this particular part <laughs> i know you're going to have to watch that more than once sorry about that guys there's no easy way to describe that other than what i just did the camera is positioned directly where the operator will stand in front of this machine this is the y-axis plus and minus so this has to rotate counterclockwise to give me the 35 degrees 31 minutes 30 seconds that i'm looking for so let's do that there's 10 20 30 35 Now this point, this is why I wanted the original dimensions that I came up with to be symmetrical. The new center line is facing away from me. The part is cocked at the 35 degree angle. And I can just plunge features right here. The very first thing I'm going to do is take this end mill and plunge it to a final depth that's thicker than the end flange. Two holes right here. Then I can draw it out. Come back to one of the holes. Continue the loop and be done with it. Relatively simple once all the setup and math is out of the way. Let's do that. One thing I would like to point out, if you are plunging an end mill like I'm plunging this end mill into this material and there's no pilot hole or there's no smaller diameter or there's no relief in the middle, the end mill has a really good possibility of cutting oversize. It might not be a whole lot, but if it's a small delicate feature and it cuts it even a couple thousandths oversize, it's gonna show up like an undercut in your part. So do yourself a favor and stay a couple thousandths away from the final location before you do an operation like this. And then move on location and make your final cut. Climb cutting to one side, on location to the left side, climb cutting out. The y-axis center line is correct, but the x-axis center line was offset by ten thousandths. I'm going to interpolate the end off of this piece, and then I'll return to this position, put it on true position, and take my final cut as a climb cut. I want this part to spin counterclockwise. Although the cutter trajectory is clockwise, the resulting part movement is counterclockwise. I am going to turn the dial on my rotary table counterclockwise to achieve that. On this particular phase 3 rotary table, phase 2 rotary table, phase 2 rotary table, uh, the direction of the dial movement translates to the direction of the table rotation. Let's do it. Gonna reset the part, take the final cut, 10 thousandths deep, climb, away we go. You can actually, if you don't want to calculate the rotational angle, you can start from one side, go halfway around and run off, and then move to the other side, go halfway around the other way and run off. No angle necessary. I just mentioned about walking off the feature, and I'm gonna actually do it just to show that it can be done. One side will be a climb cut. I'll reposition over here and I'll do a conventional cut but halfway through this feature, or about two-thirds of the way through the feature, I'm going to just two-hand this thing, and as I'm turning the rotary table, I'm going to turn the y-axis, and I'm going to push the part off the cutter. Let's see how that works out. <laughs> Here we go. Now observing where the cutter was, the cutter was up beyond center, so that had to be an x-axis move. All right? I jumped off the part halfway through in the x-axis. I'm going to reset, and I'm going to conventional cut. 
the opposite side. Cutter is reset to the tangent spot on this side. I am going to conventionally cut this, go about two-thirds of the way around, and walk off it in the direction that I think is necessary. I will probably have to pull the table off the cut this time as opposed to push it off. Let's see if it works. Okay, 50-50 blend on that part. Let's rotate it. Take a look at the surface right here and see if you can pick up on that. We're going to see this together for the first time, so let's hope it's a beautiful thing. Hey guys, virtually a seamless transition there. That's a good thing. I'm very pleased with that. Okay, next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put a slitting saw in here, and I'm going to make this 063 wide going to the tangent of the two planes that this little arm connects to, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. Get this out of the way. Let's do it. I'm going to take the slitting saw. I'm going to make contact with the stock on the left side and the front. That'll become a new zero and a new zero. I will then have... A dimension that I can work to that when I take one pass on the Y and one pass on the X I'll end up with a square back here where this connects to the much larger piece later on and that is the beauty of having a low profile slitting saw arbor right there I'm about ten thousandths above hitting this jaw with the cap so it's that surface right in here that I want to see ring. Right in here. I'll blacken that up so we can all see it together. That one and this one. Once again, the beauty of CAD. Do it. X and Y surfaces have made contact. I tell you, this star is really sharp, and that is such a superficial cut. I'm probably a couple thousandths into it, but I will stay away and blend this when I'm done. Let's make the cut. Thickness of the blade plus the thickness of the feature is the Z-axis shift here. any kind of luck I won't have to touch that again let's pop it out turn it over following the rotary table operation this is what we have now this is an unusual looking part yes it is this is the section that I just did right there so the part is sitting in the block this way I'm gonna go to work on this end and this hole breaks out into this cutout right here. So sequence of operations right here is pretty important because this is a very small hole. It's about 1.25 millimeters, 52 thou, I believe. And if you were to drill that a quarter of an inch deep and come out half a hole, you risk snapping the drill. So it's good to have material on the backside if you're going to go with half a hole. But because I don't like the way half a hole looks, I will probably stop my hole just short of breaking through that end surface. So let's reorient the part correctly mill it off the length pop that hole in and see what other features we can complete while it's standing up it is very possible that i can complete the front and rear sides and possibly the bottom of this while in that presentation 
and when I flip it over to do all the other work, I'll do the top. But you can see knock out as many features as you have to, as you can in one setup for the most guaranteed accuracy. That's a neat little part. I'm looking forward to seeing this one done. Okay, back to the vise. Let's do it. The part is back in the vise. It has been indicated to be vertical. And although the part is on a rotary table, this is not a rotary table move. From this orientation, I could actually do four sides of the, one, six, say one, four, five, there's eight surfaces on a T-nut. The two steps on either side are four total, and then the profile is another four. So I can do the outside of the T-nut and the hole. Then I'll have to put it up on a different 90 degree orientation to cut the slots on the side of the T-nut and any relief on the part. This is a fancy little part. It's very delicate when it's done. It's incredibly small. So I'm going to leave a, some material on the back side on the top of the T-nut so that it can potentially be used as a gripping surface and at the last operation, deck the whole thing off. And at least that's my philosophy. Uh, very minimal grip here. Be really careful if you're going to do this. Do not be very aggressive with any of the cuts. It would really be terrible to see this thing rotate in there and go bang. So... Let's put some cutters in there, bring it to length first, and drill the end hole. To begin the second side machining, I'm going to bring in the overall length. It is 687. It's 11 sixteenths of an inch. And you just check it one time, figure out where you're at, raise the table into the cutter. That is a 12 and a half millimeter diameter, 12.7 millimeter diameter, 500 imperial end mill that I'm using. Now we're going to put the hole in that will accept a small rod. This is going to be an 047 rod with an 052 hole. That's pretty small. I set the height off camera and raise the table to the depth that I wanted. This will not break through the T nut. That is an 052 diameter drill. That's 1.25 millimeters ish. Pretty small. Now we're going to do the T-slot or T-nut profile. I'll do just three sides. I'll do the bottom and the two vertical sides. The top profile notches will be done when it's repositioned. Creating the outer profile of the T-nut is a lot more reliable centered to that hole if it's done in the same setup that the hole was created in. That is a 140 diameter end mill. And I'm climb cutting all the finished surfaces because I just think we get a better finish on brass when you climb cut. Nice sharp cutter. And the cutter did survive that previous collision. I was surprised. I never saw that coming. Okay, guys, that is the bottom of the T-nut. That is the bottom and the sides of the T-nut. So it's the upper corners that will need to be notched at a later date. I am trying to have as much gripping surface as I can to finish the delicate features of this part so that I don't have to blow anything out this that's uh it's getting kind of skinny here let's pop it out figure out what the next step is I have a feeling I'm going to lay it flat and knock this all down so we have a couple of wings right there let's do it when I created the CAD model for this particular part I drew a halo around the finished geometry of the part representing the stock diameter or the stock size that I'm using here. So if I can bring the cutter down and just dust the finished surface of that raw material, I know how far up to raise the table or how far down to lower the quill. I always lock my quill and raise my table. It's a lot more accurate to control depths of cuts. That is the top surface of the T-nut, and I believe it's going to stay that way. This is now a finished surface. When the back surface pulls in, hopefully the back corner of that diagonal falls in at the same time. <laughs> well, it goes without saying that as you progress on this part, it is going to get very thin, and somewhere along the line, you're going to have to get creative on how to hold it. I want to do some work on either side. I want to form the T-nut profile for the end here, so these upper corners got to come off. But I don't want to leave this a feathered wing here and have to remove all of this material. It's just a recipe for disaster. So 
So at this time, I'm just going to thin a bunch of this material off right here. And we're going to work with a sacrificial block holding it so I can mill right into it. Fun little part. Let's do it. center boss needs to be knocked down to form an undercut between the key nut body and the tapered part that I did initially. I have an aluminum block in there pressing the part against the stationary jaw. An adjustable power though giving me just the right height. You need to establish a 250 front with a step down of about three quarters of a millimeter. Let's do it. This operation will create the undercut between the T-nut feature and the little lollipop on the end. It'll create the overall length of the T-nut and one side of the thinner T-nut profile cut. And it got pretty hard to see. Some of these cuts are very small, even under magnification. <laughs> Sorry about that last couple of uh, seconds there, guys. Sometimes the part is more important than the shot. I'm going to pull this out and show you what we have. Got a bunch of finished surfaces. That was a very successful pass. Whew. This thing is getting skinny. The setup for the second side cut on the T-nut and undercut feature will definitely benefit by the large lug of material that I left in the center. That is taking all the pressure from the little aluminum shim. Uh, the T-nut, the finished surface of the T-nut is registered against the adjustable parallel. And I'm going to have to be really delicate with this cut because I subscribe to a little phrase that goes, if the chip exceeds the grip, you can bet the part will slip. So you can put that one in your books, guys. If you're holding on to something and you're not holding on to it with more uh, surface area than the contact of the cutter that you're using, well, the cutter's going to win and pull that part right out, whether it's a lathe or a mill. So if the chip exceeds the grip, you can bet the part will slip. Remember that one. Put that one in the books. I'm not going to film this. You saw this done on the other side. But I'm going to knock that down with about 97 passes and bring the small step on the top of the T-nut in. And then I'm going to paint my way out of this room with another technique I think you'll also like. Stick around. Well, I was wrong. It only took 93 passes to get that done. T-nut profile is now complete. The upper lip or the upper land of the T-nut is the same land as the rest of the part. I think you can see the benefit of creating the underside of the hook with the slitting saw. You don't want too much surface contact. If you're going to side mill that, there's a very good chance it's going to bounce away or suck into the cutter. And the little superficial, sacrificial aluminum block served its purpose real well. Now I can flip this thing over on the, <laughs> the whole 075 wide back land and strap it down and nibble away at the chunk that's currently holding it. And this part will be complete with the exception of a set screw on the top. This is a tiny little part. I mean, look at the size of that thing. Ooh, always looks bigger on camera, right? All right, let's flip it over. All right, the final operation before the hole goes in. I've changed my thoughts here. I was going to strap it down and whittle away at this chunk that's been a support chunk the whole time. But the geometry of the T-nut lends itself to locating this part really nice against these jaws. These jaws are planar and parallel. So I'm just going to drop that on there and squeeze it as such. And all I need to do is knock this chunk out. And this part is ready to be held once again vertically and tapped excuse me it just flipped over 180 degrees and tapped from the other side this is not a t-nut guys it does have a t-nut profile that's hard to see it does have a t-nut profile but it's actually it actually slides in the channel on the front of the table this little mechanism in the back here moves back and forth 
as the other T-nut that holds this with a control rod in that hole. <laughs> Pay attention, there will be a quiz. This thing just moves back and forth, and this hoop disengages a gear on the end and stops the power feed. So it's really not a T-nut with an unusual handle or a link on it. It's just a guide. So that's what we're doing. This only has to be knocked down to this surface here because this width all the way back is the same size as the T-nut profile. So it will go in. If you wanted to just take it down to the, the level of this guy right here, you'd be fine. But to, trying to keep it to print, I'm going to try to get it down to the level of the original slitting saw cut and make it look like the print. Let's do it. The very top surface of this part is the longest, um, greatest surface area to grab on. And the T-nut, like I said before, the undercut surfaces of the T-nut form the little parallels. So just be very delicate when you do this. Take it down and blend the original saw cut on the lollipop end and blend the two sides of the T-nut from previous cuts. An eye loop is a good thing to have at this moment. The addition of a little Sharpie ink down in the corner that you want to blend is a really good way to see the surfaces as they come together. Be very gentle with the elevating of the table at this time as not to create a burr or an edge that you do not want to see. The milling portion of this job is complete. Uh, for sake of alignment and for sake of this thing moving around while you're working or while it's operating on the machine, I would think that the bottom surface of this T-nut would, would be served much better running all the way back to that angled link. The longer the surface, the less chance you have of deflection if it wants to move. The shorter the surface, it doesn't even have to be a lot of clearance in there and this thing could move up and down quite a bit. Surface projected, that error is reduced. I'm going to deburr this thing, get some of the black off it, flip it over and put the set screw in. We'll take a look. I am currently holding on the width of the T-nut. The T-nut is 120 wide. I'm going to indicate the gap in the jaw to get a consistent and repeatable zero on both sides of these jaws. Now, you can't see the other side, but you're going to have to trust me. It's zero on both sides. What does this tell us? Well... I know that zero is 60 thousandths away from the jaw because it's 120 wide, right? So when that indicator hits zero, I am 60 thousandths away from that jaw. It's a 120 gap. This is valuable because now since the edge finder cannot fit in that gap, I'm going to crank the table in until I pick up a zero on the end face as well. And there's a hole in that end face, so don't go in the hole. Crank it in until I see zero. All right. Now, if that's positioned correctly, as I spin this indicator, I should have three zeros. One here, which I do. One on the face, which I do. And one on this side, which you're going to have to trust me that I do. So technically, the center of this machine, the axis of the spindle, is exactly over what could be considered a 120 diameter. If I shift the table back, the radius of the known gap, the center of the spindle is now over the end of the part. Okay. Spinning a 120 circle, naturally you're 60 thou away. Move that 60 thou in, you're over the edge, make your shift for the future. That is a shop gem, guys. Practice that, remember it, get good at it. It's incredibly valuable. I'm going to pop the hole in. You've seen it done a million times. Then we'll look at this piece on the bench and how it fits. Hang in there. Let's take a look at the final product here. The symmetry on the end is pretty good. The rounds look good. The exposed surfaces, I filed and polished those out. So anything that you will actually see with any type of integrity or any type of high visibility has been cleaned up. I don't see where this fits. Pull out of that for a second. Now this little screw right here is not intended to trap this device. This fits right in the slot in the front. It 
traps a rod that goes down to another T-nut and when the table moves, this thing moves and disengages a gear down here on the end. And you can see that the concentricity of the features is relatively important. There is a shaft and a slider assembly that goes in there that telescopes in and out as it functions. And I gotta tell you, if you if you're a subscriber to this channel, you have probably seen me make some relatively challenging pieces. And although this piece doesn't really appear to be all that challenging, holding a piece like this, you better really plan your sequence of operations or you're going to get stuck. I hope that you enjoyed watching this video. And I hope that uh, some of the ideas presented will help you if you have to make this part. Or maybe if you have to make a part that's somewhat like it, you'll utilize some of the logic an approach that I did. Thank you very much for watching wherever you are in the world. I hope you're well, happy, and safe. All the above. I am Joe Pye at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out.